What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Patrick Howden. He was on episode one, and now he's back for episode one to four all. And we talk about still the same topic, connection, and how to make it happen to get to the real deep level. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes and download my free one-page summary. And now, lean back and enjoy. Patrick, I'm so excited to have you back. 123 episodes later. So back then, on episode one of the Workshops Work podcast, you shared about the importance of a check-in and connection. And I am really curious to follow up with you on this topic. And before getting there, I think back then I haven't asked that question as a warm-up. So I have the opportunity now to ask you, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? <laughs> well, a lot of other people. First of all, I'm glad to be here. Like, total, you know, mega. <laughs> really, like really glad to be here. And a lot of people have called me a lot of names. <laughs> Not all of them so good, you know. So you can call me whatever you want, you know, but... uh I think the beyonder fits nicest. Mm. You know, there isn't like a single monocle to describe any human being. I don't think, right? So are we this? Are we that? <laughs> are we something more? I think we're more. And beyond is a good way to articulate that we're further. <laughs> And that we're, especially now after these 16 months of craziness in the world, we're further than that. We're beyond facilitator. We're on mm. the other side something deeper. It's bringing goodness to the world, holding a space that's safe and strong and deep. So I think that, you know, articulation is up to every person to find what fits best in the moment they're in, you know, mm. and I think uh, that's kind of cool. So I'd, I'd say uh, the first Beyonder kind of fits to me. Which... Triggers two curiosities in me. One is, when did you start calling yourself a beyonder? <laughs> And what does it take to move from facilitator to beyonder? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I can't probably remember exactly when it was, but sometime in the last 15 years, uh, somebody said it, beyonder, because I was talking about beyond, you know, beyond leadership, the beyond company. We do beyond stuff, you know. And um, I guess that came up and then I was, it came up and I was watching Marvel Captain America and I've got a little bit of an American accent. So Captain America is kind of cool. He's a lot better looking than me. Definitely. You know, but he's the first Avenger. And, and then I said, wait a minute, wasn't Beyonder the Beyonder also a Marvel superhero. And then I looked it up and yeah, there was a Marvel superhero called, The Beyonder. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, if Captain America is the first Avenger, I might as well be the first Beyonder. <laughs> so that's that's where that came from, I think. Yeah. And I think when we dare to go further than we've ever gone before, to do something that has never been done before, then you're basically on the other side of just a facilitator or moderator or consultant or trainer or coach, you know. The other side are those that dare to go mm. further. And by going further, we learn more. We fail more, <laughs> you know, but we learn more. And if we're in a space with others that feel the same, then all of us are beyonders. We're, we're urging uh, each other onwards. Uh, we're helping each other feel more courage. So we're being encouraged, you mm. see. And so that space of that mindset of going beyond is more a mindset and less a term or a word or a description. But those that are in a room that are beyond, they feel it, they know it, and they give it 
to the others. They 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 uh, encourage them uh, to take the step they may not have dared by themselves. Take a step that helps us grow mm. and basically helps us become better human beings to others and to each other. Thank you for elaborating that. And while listening, I I heard a few characteristics, maybe skills that you use, like daring to go beyond. So experimentation, we might fail, but we still do. I heard curiosity. I heard holding space. What are for you the key skills or mindsets that you would encourage us to nurture in order to help groups to go beyond? Well, I think there's a kernel inside, you know. It's because you care. Mm. You care so much that you go places you would never go yourself. You would never do it for yourself. You would only do it for others because you care so much. And because you care so much, you dare. Because <laughs> you care, you dare, you know? And then and then you kind of go there, right? Yeah. And and I think for the facilitators and moderators and coaches and trainers and all those folks out there, you know, find a friend. <laughs> find one other person that's crazy like you and um, and dare each other, right? One of my favorite games as a kid, <laughs> truth or dare. <laughs> you know, that was so much fun. But it really is because the curiosity is what binds us as human beings. You know, we're intensely curious about what's in front of us, what we can't see, <laughs> you know, the magic of the magician. We want to know. We want to know. How does he do that? How does he do that? Right. And that intense curiosity uh, coupled with that deep, caring mindset together makes it easy to go places you've never been and, and to take a step you would not have stepped. But more importantly, having a friend with you makes it almost natural to do that because I think the, for me, the most basic human instinct is not survival. Mm. <laughs> It's the, uh, the betterment of the human condition for the tribe, for the community, for the village, for the young people, for everybody around us, making it better for others. Is kind of like a base built-in thing, you know? And so I think that whole combination of those three or four factors are important. The skills don't matter. Can you talk? No. Do you look good? doesn't matter. D can you, do you look good? No, it don't matter. <laughs> do you? Nothing. And nothing else matters. And, and, and there's too much thinking around competencies and skills and stuff. All those stuff doesn't matter. Mindset attitude is 90%. Mm -hmm. Mindset attitude in the heart, the loving heart to give is uh, 90%. The rest you will find. And because all the base abilities are just basic, you know, we can, you know, we, we can do that stuff, you know, basically. So thank you. And I'm curious to hear your, your approach to that, because what happens very often is that we lose curiosity towards others just because we are so busy with ourselves. And in order to build this connection that you described, to have this curiosity to care so much that you do dare to do things that you wouldn't dare to do for yourself, just to be there for the group. You need to have this presence, open mind and curiosity. So how do you get there? And maybe to give it also a little bit of context, you've been hosting monthly sessions at the Never Done Before community that now we call internally the monthly spa. <laughs> and what I observe is one of your superpowers is that you always care for every individual and you bring all the love and curiosity to every individual, independent of how they are, how they behave, how they show up in the space. How did you get there? What does yeah. it take to <laughs> really have this genuine curiosity that you show that many lack, to be honest? Yeah, well, thank you uh, for going there. So I think we're all born with it. I think everybody has it. Yeah. And, um, and the coolest part is that there is a natural mechanism to activate that in any setting, any environment, any culture, any language in probably 60, 90 seconds or less. You know, it's just incredible that when you utilize the um, correct interaction protocol 
it activates these deep-seated abilities within us, and it reawakens that curiosity. It reawakens that the caring, uh, even if you've lost it. You know, it kind of reawakens that uh, you start standing up taller. You know, sitting straighter. <laughs> not not because someone told you to sit straighter, because you get that a lot. Not because someone told you you have to be more in curious or more this or more that. We got too much of that in the world. People telling us you got to be this or that or this or that mm -hmm. in order to be able to do this or that. There's too much of that in the world. The answer is be your natural self. But it, the the biggest question is how the hell. Uh, do I get into my natural self, right? Without, you know, 17 day silent, you know, meditation retreat in a monastery at the top of a mountain in the middle of fucking nowhere, right? You know, so getting into that natural state in 60 to 90 seconds or less is a cool thing. And what it does when you start to use it, you start looking like this, you know, you start getting a big grin on your face and you look like 15 years younger than you really are. You breathe better, you eat better, you sleep better, you drink better, you care better for yourself. Uh, you stand straighter, you know, uh, you walk stronger. It's really weird. <laughs> the side effects of being in your most natural state and having an environment and being able to set up a space where just that happens. No, not more, not less. Nothing complicated. And let's not try to attempt to create anything or to achieve anything or have any output or any results, which makes us Germanic people really crazy. Because why would we ever be together with other people if we don't have a result? You know, feeling good is not a result. Being happy is not a result. You know, having joy is definitely not a result. You know, I can't write it down. I can't put it on a uh, Excel sheet or a PowerPoint slide, you know? So I think reducing everything down to its most basic fundamental elements happens so rarely, especially in the business settings that most of us are in. We're trying to survive. We're trying to make money. <laughs> We're trying to feed the family, put our kids through university. You know, all this craziness that's going on uh, is very complicated, is, is very encompassing, right? And finding a way to reduce that down to something really, really simple is key. And once you're in that space, it's good. It's, mm. it's strong. You know, it's peaceful. Uh, it's, it's you're filled with gratitude. Wow. So what's going on in that space kind of, you know? Yes. So let's dive into that space. You mentioned 60 to 90 seconds, which is super short, but maybe just our attention span. <laughs> So what are you doing in these 60 to 90 seconds to really get to the core of this connection that you described? Well, you know, we could do it and then we'll explain it, right? So I can, you know, look over at you with a smile, you know, say, hey, Miriam, you know, and ask you something foundationally, something very simple. Just ask you, how are you? Really? And now for those who don't see the video, just to explain... When Patrick asked me, how are you, really, he looked straight in the camera so that I have the impression he looks straight into my eyes and I feel the genuine care in his question. So how am I really? I am in a good place that finally after 18 months of craziness, I found my way to have a, a rhythm And I'm trying to, no, I'm starting to embrace this uncertainty that goes along with running a business, running a community that has the name never done before. So there's always failure and uncertainty involved. And looking forward with curiosity to what will happen when the world opens shortly, maybe again. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, how are you, really? I uh, thank you for the question, but I get to feedback you first. Now, I noticed a couple things, you know. So, as you spoke, you started looking around, and when you said rhythm, actually, your body was started moving in like a rhythm as you looked at this space you were talking about. So there was a smile. The eyes you started calming down as you spoke. The more you saw, the calmer you became. You know, I saw your eyes see some of the dark spots and move away. <laughs> so it was really <laughs> funny to watch. You kind of went, you saw the dark spot, and you kind of whoop, 
you moved right away from it. You didn't call it out. You kind of mentioned it with, yeah, I got to make money. You got to do all this stuff. So I'm, I felt the way you talked, all that other stuff at the same time. But your breathing changed. And then when you looked at the future, you know, it was really funny. You looked. You did, you, as you were tasting the food of the future, you tasted the future, your tongue came out, and, you, and it was such a cool move because it felt like you dipped into that future state and you're like, this is why I'm going through this because I know the other side is better, you know? So those are the things I noticed. That's what I appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. That is, um, it feels like a warm shower to have this reflection back and a sense of, I think some would call it deep listening, that you listen beyond beyond the words, but to my body posture, to what I'm not saying. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts we can give to someone is to just listen and to reflect back and to make someone feel listened. So how are you really? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like, I'm like, so happy to be with you. You know, we have so much that connects us. So just being in the presence of someone that you love, kind of rekindles all the different reasons that you're in love, you know, like the 10, 15, 20 things, our version of love of, you know, Vietnam, all the memories come up, you know, so it makes me feel really familiar, you know, family familiar, kind of really close, you know, my family, my kids. And stuff and uh, so that's a good feeling to have that makes me feel real good and then you know I've got my lead back from London she from college for a little break she's going to do her bachelor's in two years <laughs> so she's like pushing it really hard and her uh, bigger sister is three years old or just finished her bachelor uh, but my Lee will finish so Christine finished now she's three years older but my Lee finishes one year later but she's three years younger <laughs> and she has to work so hard to do it. And uh, Christine just kind of flies through with a 1.0, you know, 4.0 uh, grade point average and stuff. So, and that's kind of cool. But this little guy, little five-year-old Jason Lee, I went to swimming training with him today, you know, and he can, he don't like to put his head underwater and stuff. He's putting water, put his nose in, looks over at me. He says, no way, I'm not doing this. I said, come on, you can do it. He goes, no way, I'm not doing this. And yeah, you can do it. You can do it. You know? So the next couple of days I'm going to, do that, you know, and I think, uh, you know, how I am really is I've been home for 16 months and last week I had my first trip away and everybody was glad I was gone. <laughs> my wife, my kids, they were like, yeah, we're glad you're, you're out there. You're doing your thing. You're like an NBA basketball player. Now you're finally playing a game, you know, so they really liked it. That was gone. But when I came back, little Jason Lee said, dad, I missed you 116, 72, five. I said, whoa, that's cool. That sounds like a, a whole lot. It's really funky number, but it's a whole lot, right? So that lit me up being gone, having my little backpack here with my mobile gear where I can do what we're doing anywhere in the world. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to be places. I'm going places. So that's how I am, really. Thank you, Patrick. And it was what I sensed and saw and what I appreciate is how you went from the present moment, relating it to the past, what you appreciate in the past, back to the present. And then first you reflected on our connection, why you're happy to be here in the moment. And then there was this pause. And then your family came to your mind and to your heart. And then you explored the entire beauty of your family and acknowledged each individual member having a glimpse at their present and their future. And then it was just like a walk at <laughs> looking into the future. What is about to happen now that you're boarding this rocket and starting to travel again? Great energy. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for reflecting back. You know, now, now it just you've just been woven into the family rocket. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, so no, it's nice. It's good to see it. It's good to see the effect it has on your you as you speak back to me and on me as I speak back to you. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting also our the entire audience into this very 
Yeah, personal space. And I think this really showed what might happen. And I just, I can just imagine that as a listener, it might sound weird to be suddenly in the space as a spy almost, as a listener. But this is what happens in these sessions that you host. How do you create the space that actually the two that will meet each other and create this connection very short times in a very short moment? How do you create the space? How do you get them mentally there? How do you articulate the invitation to do that so that everyone feels strong enough to dive into this awkward moment of exposing themselves to maybe a colleague and maybe a stranger? Yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, you you almost ask a mechanical question <laughs> and, and, and like, okay, how do I do the mechanics on that? Well, since it is our most natural state, it is the easiest thing in the world to initiate the moment for the moment of moments. How cool is that? Initiate the moment for the moment of moments. Because you can never recreate the moments. All you can do is increase the likelihood of them being able to happen. <laughs> with an invitation, you know, the invitation to be your most natural self, but not even to say that, to basically say, hey, everybody, I'm glad to be here. You guys ready to get started? Why? Because they showed up in that room for a reason, maybe for multitudes of reasons. Maybe many of them don't even want to be in the room. <laughs> They're like, what the hell's going on? What is this? <laughs> many times that's what people think when managers invite you to something and give you no transparency or information on what the hell is going on. Mm. You get in the room, you go like, damn, what's this? Especially if you're Germanic, <laughs> like me, <laughs> we hate stuff that's out of our control. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, you never heard of that before, right? So, so, so what do you do? What do you do is you just kind of say, hey, I'm glad to be here because that relationship now with me and 200 others or a thousand others up to a thousand we can do is one side of it. I only ever have one side of a relationship. It's mine. So if I decide to smile and say hello, I'm going to smile, say hello. And then I'm going to say, I'm glad to be here. Right. And then I'm going to just invite everybody. Would you, you know, want to get started? And then people go, wait a minute. He didn't say what the agenda is. He didn't say what we're here to achieve. He didn't even introduce his company, much less himself. <laughs> It says Patrick Beyond. You know, we can't find a guy on social media. Oh, we did find him on LinkedIn. Oh, shit. What, what's this? What's going on? Right. So, no, basically say, hey, you guys want to start. And then then for me, if I've got 200 people there, I just get I just need one or two to say yes <laughs> or nod their head. And I'm like, OK, I got that. I, I hear some yeses out there. Right. And then uh, you just initiate the most natural thing is uh, when you enter a room with friends. What are the first two things you do? Smile and you say hello. Yeah, there it is, right? I just asked that. And, and at least one person going to say, smile and say hello. And I say, well, guess what? Off you go. Three minutes, 30 seconds. Rooms of eight. Get out of here. Go smile. Say hello. Pass it on to the next guy. <laughs> Bye. And I do that, right? And they come back three and a half minutes later in a different state. You know, that 180 seconds. Magic line. You know, 30 seconds at the end is just the closing time for the room. But the 180 seconds. It triggers. They come back. Guess what? More people are smiling. Right? I ain't done nothing except go say, smile and say hello. And hell, some people go in the room and they're not smiling people. They look like, <laughs> uh, yeah, like in Men in Black. Uh, what's his, the, I forgot the uh, actor's name, but he. Will Smith. Yeah. And his buddy, the older guy, right? Ooh. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The older guy. He says, I'm looking for this guy. He walks around and when he smiles, he looks like this, you know, which you guys can't see, but the guy never smiles. <laughs> so some guys will go in a room and they won't smile. But here's the funny thing. People can smile with their mind or their heart or their breath. Maybe not with their face, <laughs> but they're, they're kind of doing what they can. And that's all that counts is you're doing what you can, right? If you, you know, we do events for uh, handicapped people. Some handicapped people, they got nothing. They can, no, no articulation except a computer. They're quadriplegic. They can't move nothing. They can't talk nothing. Their tongue hits this uh, tube and then the machine talks. But I'm telling you, 
they get so excited. <laughs> they get so excited. <clears throat> They're trying like hell to smile. Their whole body can't smile, but their whole body is trying so hard just to smile in that room of eight. And they, they tell people afterwards, like they come back to us after and say, it was so cool. I was in a room doing shit like normal people do. <laughs> uh, I was trying to do it. I was trying to smile and say hello. And then my machine did it and everybody was like normal with me. Like normally they're, they're afraid of me, uh, you know? So I think that, uh, that that's uh, the initiation is just, Hey, I'm saying hi. I'm first. I smile. I say hello. I'm glad to be here. That's something positive. And now I'm going to pass it on to you guys. Oh, there's a 200 of you or a thousand of you. It don't matter. Go in rooms and say hello. You know, and that's how we initiate. And then all the other steps we do are just as natural, just as logical, just as steps for stentless. It's like common sense. You know, the first thing you do after you say hello is like common sense. You know, those all those steps are the natural flow of human cooperation and collaboration. And we have 15 years of science backing us up, uh, a deep, deep understanding of the natural state and how to initiate the natural state, not just in individuals, more importantly, in groups, the group natural state, a group well being or mindfulness is very different than individual mindfulness or, or well-being. It's very, very different. There's different mechanisms. There's different elements you need to trigger, you know? So it's really funny that, you know, we've gotten so good at it. We've got over 3,000 sessions and, and 600 of those just in the last year, <laughs> you know? What have you observed, especially you're working with large companies now where basically if I understand it correctly, their staff members are going through this flow to learn to reconnect to each other and thereby improve team building productivity. I think all of the things you can put numbers on and you can put spreadsheets around, but you're providing the basis for that. So what have you observed? What have you learned from these 3000 sessions? Yeah, that it always works. It, it has, it always works all 3000 times. And, and, I'm, I'm sure that there's been more than 3,000 times done by others that we don't even know who they are, <laughs> like you. I'm one of them. <laughs> and we did, you know, at the first festival last year, we, everybody had it as part of their check-in, you know, using the interaction protocol. So that single line of code is pretty amazing. And, and our learnings are just now that uh, clients are sustaining every week over and over again for a year and then extending a second year now uh, over and over again. Every week, they keep doing it. <laughs> you know, and we're like, this is crazy. They're coming in the room, same flow, same questions. Okay. A little bit different because as we progressed over the last 16 months, we keep shifting the flow, right? We don't change the protocol. As you've seen, the protocol seems that we've nailed that, uh, but we change the, the order of questions and we, we, it, we shift them a little bit like the, how are you really? <laughs> I'm just adding that really, as you noticed when you did it the first time, and many of uh, the folks in the room, you know, went into social media and shared that, how huge the really is, yeah. but then connect it to the protocol of listening to appreciate and not listening to respond or listening uh, to, to understand, you know, to go beyond understanding and go to appreciation uh, as the baseline is very different because then I don't have to listen to what you say. I don't, ha I don't have to listen to what you say because there's no way I can understand what you're saying anyway. If you look at the behavior psychologist, they'll tell you there's no way in one or two or three minutes you can ever really understand what the other person's trying to convey. It just ain't going to happen. But you can sense all the goodness that's happening and, or all the reality that's happening. And you can reflect that back. And that's for the biggest gift you can give another human being is true, deep, honest, real, appreciative feedback to uh, them as a human being. And that trigger, that ignition point uh, is a core element of, of the interaction protocol. And, and all the organizations that are starting to use it now, they're not all big. I mean, we have a small company with, they've got 30 employees. <laughs> it's their monthly team meeting. And then they put a 60 minute flow at the front of that and it blows them away every time. And, and they just keep doing it. You know, we've got uh, organizations with uh, several hundred people and they're part of organizations with uh, 10, 15, 20, 50,000 people, you know, so we, 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 it's truly a foundational change to how people are with each other. And it's so deeply foundational, the shift that happens, that it significantly increases their ability to learn, to grow, to perform, to create, to collaborate, 
to innovate, to, to do things, basically to get shit done like you never know. So the efficacy, the group efficacy, which is beyond confidence, which is beyond ability. It's just the efficacy means you have the ability to do it, <laughs> which is different. I can read 10 books on Aikido, which is the dojo behind me, and I can't do a millimeter of Aikido. But to be a master at Aikido, you're looking at 20, 30 years of practice <laughs> to be able to have that efficacy that you truly can do it, right? And, and the crazy part is that the actual doing of our jobs is something we have no problems with. The skill set uh, in 99% of the jobs around the world, that, that is totally not the issue. The issue is how do we bring it together with others and how do we set an environment where our ability to excel, our ability to go places we didn't go before is a factor 10 bigger, right? And in and, and our clients for the last you know five years, they've been saying it's factor 10 because they pay us 10x more money than they would ever pay for a consultant, you know? So for me, if someone's paying me 10 times the daily rate of someone else, <laughs> you know, $50,000 a day instead of $5,000 a day, there's got to be a reason for that. You know, there's got to be a reason someone would pay that much money for a 60 minute nothing, you know, where we do nothing except remind them of these basic, basic elements. So I think there's something about that. And the learning is that it can sustain and mm. it can stick. And the learning is that you can apply it in multitudes of settings. You know, uh, every one of our clients uses it for new hires when they onboard new people. It's And the CEO is in the room, right? They use it for uh, now we got one client on a merger and acquisition environment where they know, wow, this is going to be so powerful for the integration teams to really get connected, really have a foundational element. And uh, And everyone forgets that it's not about communication. That's Communication and cooperation and collaboration are the three higher levels of human interaction. But underneath that, that interaction connection quality, which is based on interaction. So there's two layers underneath communication that most people are not aware of. There's a connection layer and an interaction layer. The quality of your interaction uh, leads to the quality of connection. The quality of connection leads to quality of cooperation because it's the bridge to trust. You see, and that's it, you know, and, and knowing those two layers that we, we only work on those two layers down at the bottom and they have a bigger impact on uh, communication, cooperation and collaboration than any other co-creation tool on the planet that doesn't go after those layers at the bottom. They're good at, you know, we'll create some stuff better. We'll cooperate better, but they forget that we're not communicating well and we're not connecting well, which means we're not caring enough underneath. Right. And if you only care in the room of the facilitator, great. What we're saying is you embed that in the daily operational reality of every single team in your organization. Yeah. And what I love about what you just said is that it's on the one hand so disruptive to what I would say general pop science is saying, oh, we have to work on our communication skills. And listening means being able to, to listen to the words that someone said. And what I find intriguing in the way that you guide through the exercise is that you provide the stage for the participants to really listen beyond the words because you basically tell them that the words are not relevant exactly what you just shared. And if you take away the pressure that someone has to reply something smart, you're sharing how you're doing really, you might share something really personal, and then I have to say something smart. So instead of really being present and just allowing you the space, I might then be trying to pick on the small information so that I can reply something. Whereas you're saying, okay, Listen to appreciate. Don't listen to answer or to ask any question. Just listen to appreciate because you won't understand it anyway. Then gives me permission to really be present and then say something appreciative afterwards that will really make this connection. Hey, since you are listening to this podcast, I was wondering whether you get enough opportunities to exchange, practice and experiment with other facilitators. Have you heard of the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival? It's a 24-hour global event 
that is co-created by its participants and delivered by some of the most popular workshops work podcast guests. Visit neverdonebefore.org for more information. Use the code WORKSHOPSWORK to get a 20% discount. The festival starts as soon as you join. Now, back to the show. I'm currently reading this book, which is intriguing. It's called You Are Not Listening on Why It Matters. And he basically says the same, that we're constantly listening to reply and thereby we are missing all the opportunity for connection and real curiosity. And the other thing I wanted to point out, <laughs> just to share also with the audience, because I think it's, it is a high skill how you, you guide through the protocol, as you call it, which is absolutely natural to every human being, although we seem to have forgotten about it or unlearned it when we communicate in groups. And there's one thing you always say before you send the groups off into the breakouts to answer the question, how are you really? I think you cite your daughter, Miley, that if you ask her how you're doing, she said, I'm good. I'm doing fine. How are you? Thank you. <laughs> and so if your answer is I'm fine, thank you, then three minutes can be very long. <laughs> And I think just by framing it this way gives the participants then also permission to just take their time and be present. And by being present, we learn to listen. And by listening, we connect. And by connecting, we can then communicate. Yes, <laughs> to all of the above, you know. And, and, and even if I said none of the above, when you get in the room and, the pro and, and you get close to the protocol – You know, most people don't always kind of like stick to the protocol, right? They kind of, you lean into that protocol and um, you ask the other person, how are they really? And, uh, you know, that 90 seconds, probably they're going to go somewhere approximately, you know, and then you're going to respond and see the pressure's on you because you're supposed to respond with goodness. You may not know what that is. You may not know how to do that, but you sure to hell don't want to get embarrassed when they, when they finish and you've got nothing to say. And just, the, just that element of knowing that right now, really, you're the only person in the world there for that person. On the whole planet, you're in that little Zoom room or in a physical room <laughs> and looking at each other and that person is telling you the real deal. And what they may be saying is that they don't feel good. Their life may be really, really bad right now. Worse than it's ever been in their lives. And they're going to tell you. And you're going to feel it. And even if they try to make it a little bit nicer than it is, you're going to feel the truth of how bad it really is. And then that moment's going to open when they stop. And you're going to have a choice. What do I do now? And if you follow your natural, most basic instinct, you're going to give them comfort and goodness back for what they shared. And you're going to identify because you have been there. You have felt that darkness around you at least once in your life. And you would have wished someone would have been there for you at that moment. And because of that, you're going to be there for them in whatever fuddled, muddled way you're going to try, okay? And, and what they're going to notice when you're trying, they're going to notice how hard you're trying. And you might be an older person, a senior person in the company. That might be a really young lady that's really in trouble. And you're fumbling it because you're not good at this. <laughs> you think you're not good at this. But see, when we care, we try. And when we try, it's good enough. And because it's good enough, we connect. And that moment of a, whatever you were able to give, you gave. When she acknowledges his back, she's going to acknowledge that. She won't just say thank you. She's going to say thank you because you were just there for me, man. <laughs> and then she's going to ask you that question back, right? And then you're probably going to go somewhere you didn't think you were going to go because she just did that <laughs> for you, right? And now she's, guess what? You just gave her goodness back. What's she going to do? She's going to try to give it back better to you than you gave it to her. And then you're going to stop. And you know what's going to come. And maybe she's going to give it back better than you have ever, ever received appreciation from another human being in your life. And um, it's going to move you deeply. And uh, it's going to change the course of uh, the rest of your life. Because when you begegna you want, <laughs> when you encounter someone, again, even in the same session, you're going to go, dang, that girl just blew me away, man. So I'm listening different. 
Okay. And it's funny because you only, all that learning happened without the moderator or facilitator not once talking about what listening really is. I mostly don't do that thing with, you know, really listen and whatever. I just, just let them go at it because you're in that room. And what I'm saying, it doesn't ha always happen the way I just said it. This was an example, right? But if it does, you've got 200 people in a room that go through 10 steps of this in 60 minutes, right? Is the likelihood higher than if they would have been in their normal meetings with each other? Yes. Is it very high? Damn, yes. I think it's 80% plus, <laughs> you know? And our clients, they're going like, this is so crazy, man. This is so crazy. They're starting to call it the game changer. It's an operating system. It's a, it's a new operating model. We are shifting the base interaction protocol between human beings in a manner that guarantees and ensures a positive outcome every single time forever. There is no negative outcome in any of these two times 90 seconds. It's just, it has never happened. And I mean, the 3000 sessions times 10 is 30,000 steps <laughs> that we've done, you know, and uh, 6,000 of those uh, in the digital space, you know, now we're back in doing physical and digital. It says our clients realize that the interaction protocol, be it digital or physical, it doesn't matter. So if you're going to meet in the physical space, you're going to meet with this protocol. You're going to spend two days in the physical space and not have a computer with you because you've decided to be in the physical space. And if you're in the physical space, don't touch a computer because if you're touching a computer, you might as well go back in the digital space, especially if two, three, four, five other guys are on the computer anyway. So go back into the digital space. There's no reason in the world to ever have a hybrid meeting ever, ever. There's no justification at all, not a single reason for any human being on the planet to not either be all digital or all physical. There's no reason. If my friend in Tokyo invites me to dinner, I do not open my computer. If I just landed in Las Vegas from Berlin and he calls me and he's 84 years old and says, Patrick, can you come to dinner? I go, of course I can. I say, when do you want me to come? He says, tomorrow. Okay. So I get on an airplane, I fly to Tokyo. If I have dinner, he says, thank you after dinner. Goodbye. I leave. I fly through Istanbul back to Berlin. I just flew around the world for a dinner. But would I open a computer to have a dinner with someone? So we have to understand that we can never go back to what was before. And we can't go forward with our current understanding of reality. We have to go beyond. We have to break all the rules that are currently being told to us in the world and turn off this hybrid, unbelievable craziness, you know, and say, if we're going to collaborate in digital, then go digital, man. It's digital works great if you use interaction protocols that deeply activate our ability to work together. If everyone's screen is off and they're muted and two guys are talking and 200 people are watching it, that ain't going to work. Of course not, right? But if you get into this space that we create, and we don't create it, the teams create it. And just by using the protocol, then you get that quality in digital space and can be digital. And then if you're going to get together, like my clients last week, they didn't touch a computer for two days. And they said, you know what? Every year, the last 10 years, we do this strategy offsite. We always worked on our computers in the physical room. And now Patrick shows up and we're doing, you know, two days outside with the cows, you know, lots of flies out there, you know, it's, it smells funny, you know, it's real life. It's nature. <laughs> it's a good thing for humanity, for human beings to be breathing air outside instead of sticking in a stupid conference room and thinking you're working in a good way because you're calling it hybrid. It's, it's uh, for me personally, uh, it's, it's going to demolish what's left of humanity if we let it happen. So go digital or go physical and do not mix that because there's no reason to do so. So None what, whatsoever, right? And that's that's pretty clear. Thank you for being so clear. I love this radical, <laughs> explicit opinion. And wonder, why do you think is there such a hybrid hype at the moment? Why is everyone talking about hybrid and feels the urge of finding an in-between solution? Oh, there's a simple answer to that. The managers want people back in the office so they can kick them in the teeth. And the people that don't want to come back in the office because it's a whole lot more fun being out of the office. So that conflict automatically results in the compromise. And I got to tell you, I've been divorced multiple times in my life. I'm sad to say. <laughs> Compromises never work. It just doesn't work. Forget it. It's, just, it's, it's the worst of both versions, right? So why force people back in the office? 
which a lot of companies are going to do, right? Why not have that flexibility of that freedom of you decide your own space, okay? But if we're going to be collaborating and a number of us is digital anyway, well, then let's be on equal footing. Let's be in that digital space, even if we're sitting in a physical office somewhere. Why? Because that equal footing gives all of us the necessity of that baseline of opening up and being equal <laughs> and not the physical guys have a better meeting space or hell, I got to tell you, the meeting rooms in most companies suck. <laughs> they suck really bad, especially when they got plexiglass. There's no more gummy bears. You no longer share gummy bears in your office. Uh, there's small cubes in the United States of America. You got like 1.2 square meters each. You know, it's really bad. It's really terrible. And you got to commute for three hours to get there. Why would you go someplace that's so bad? Because you don't happen to have the Apple campus where you can walk around in the forest on campus, <laughs> you know, good for those guys. Yeah. Uh, and they should do all their meetings walking around outside. Yeah. And, uh, and then have their headset on and it's great, you know, cause I can be outside in a digital setting. I can be with my kids in a digital setting. You know, the other day I finished a meeting uh, here in Berlin <laughs> and it took me it, it, at 10 PM at night at a TV studio, uh, doing a hybrid format, you know, and it was unstrengthened as hell quality sucked. It was really bad. <laughs> And it took me another two and a half hours to get home after midnight. And otherwise, it would took me two and a half seconds to move from my computer screen uh, to 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 the my bar and had a cold beer and shit. Right. So we have to stop illusioning ourselves. Right. We have to sit down and ask ourselves the question: What do I really need? What do I really want? What do we really want? We should ask that question and not let organizations dictate what they believe is the single only working model that's going to be allowed for the whole planet. And then Microsoft Teams does all that technological development and Zoom does all that technological development. So we have one version for the world that works instead of saying, no, we're going to ask our people, not only how are you really, but what do you need really? And our responsibility as leaders of this organization is to understand firstly, the state of my people and secondly, what they need to be better. And those are the only two things leaders need to know. They need to know nothing else, nothing else whatsoever. That's the only responsibility they have is the state of their people and make sure, ensure that it's in a better state. And, 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 and if, if, if it's about where they're going to be, I ask them in the part of what do you need? Uh, if I need to be physical, then I don't go to the office to get on computers. If I need to be physical, we go somewhere together. We're outside. We're doing something physical together. We're going drinking together. We're going dinner together. And we're not opening up a line to the guys in, in, in Asia that couldn't come to the dinner or the <laughs> going out because we want to be hybrid or some crazy stuff. You know, so I think the clarity needs to be established that we step away from the confusion and we go to the clarity, if we really truly care to set up environments that are inclusive of everyone and lets everyone at an equal footing participate in the establishment of a future state, that everyone participate by asking everyone the question in my organization, how are you? Why are we here? And what do we need? Those three questions, right? And then empowering them to determine those answers and to determine the realities that they need for themselves. And then people will answer. And they'll say, this is what I need, and this is why I need it, and this is what I'd like to have. And then setting up those environments that work fluidly for everybody. you know. And I think uh, once we understand that it is really only a digital or a physical space, and that there is no virtual space. See, virtual means it's not real. If I've got a virtual friend, it's not real. It's a game. I'm playing a game. It's a virtual reality. It's not real. It's virtual, right? No, digital social connections and physical social connections are as powerful as each other. And for some people, it's easier to establish social connections in the digital space for many, many people. For most introverted people, we feel and you probably said, Patrick, you're not. Yes, I am introvert. So we feel so much more. Thank you. We feel so much more comfortable in a digital setting to open up because we decide in every moment of that encounter how far we go, how far we don't go. We're looking at all the signals we're getting from another person. And then we know, you know, how far we're going to go or not go in the physical setting can be so intimidating. <laughs> you know, you got eight of these big guys in the room and four little girls and the eight guys are doing the alpha male thing and it's getting really ugly and you don't know what it's crazy, man. So to force people into these settings that used to be natural, <laughs> <laughs> but are so intimidating, so non-inclusive, 
that's a sad decision to make. And I think in the digital space, we're more free. If I was in a wheelchair, you wouldn't notice <laughs> and you shouldn't because it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? I've got my other failings in my life that you're not aware of, you know, my wardrobe, I can wear the same shorts and t-shirt like four days in a row and my wife no. doesn't have to wash, wash so much stuff, you know, it's really weird. There's so many elements and there's been so much science already in research done that the better version of ourselves is the digital version because we have so much control of determining the environment we're in, the state we're in. If I need a coffee, I don't need to get up out of the meeting and all that shit. I got my coffees here. I got my really cool. I'm going to do a little verbum here. Clean canteen. Super cool. You know, like I've got the clean canteen uh, you know, for my water and shit. So I'm not drinking out of a bottle. You know, there's so much more freedom and um, safety psychological safety we can establish in the, the digital space that is almost impossible to do in the physical space because of those things. Some people feel uncomfortable in dark rooms. Some people feel uncomfortable with the uh, big projector projecting out at the front or the funky chairs that they use in conference rooms and so vita and so vita, the Germans would say, and so on and so on. There's uh, more reasons for us to enhance the digital experience and be the best of anything we can be digital. And then when we do meet physical, be friends. Like last week I went to Sweden, okay? We jumped uh, naked off the cliffs into the water. Oh, wait a minute. We weren't naked because my friend said in Sweden, they put you in jail if you jump naked in the water. <laughs> so we left our undershorts on. Okay, jump 10 meters off the cliff. I'm afraid of heights. I got to tell you, I am so afraid of heights. I, If I had pants on, I'd have made it in my pants, right? But he's holding my hand, my Swedish friend, you know, he's holding my hand. He says, on the count of three, we're going to jump. Like, oh, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. But he holds my hand and we jump into that water. Uh, we do that everywhere in the world. Whenever we meet, we find water and we go jump in. And, um, and then I'm not scared as scared. <laughs> I'm still scared. We did it three times. Okay. We jumped three times. Uh, I was close. Then I was really, really brave. I'm like, oh man, I was ready to go a fourth time. But he said, no, no, it's enough now. I said, oh, I'm so happy you said it was enough now because I was going to go a fourth time, you know, and maybe die. You know, I'm almost 60 years old. I could probably hit that cold water and almost die and shit. Right. So if we're going to be physical, then we go see people we want to see firstly, because they're our friends beyond leadership. Uh, so Bill Sox once said, is friendship. Okay. That's the future. So we're going to be with friends. We're going to do friend things. Okay. And the last thing friend things do, at least at my age is play on a computer. You know, now if I'm a gamer, okay, I'm going somewhere to be gamer, gamer guy. Right. But uh, for me, um, I want to be with people because I care for them. We go back to what we started with because I care so much and they give me so much in every encounter that I have with them. I want to come visit so that I can give back. And I think when that quality of connection is felt deeply based on that interaction quality of really, really being there for each other, the way we would always wish for, you know, the first 42 years of my life, I had no friends, you know, and that's a sad story, which we'll maybe at a different time we'll talk about. But, you know, when I did find friends, um, they became like holy and sacred to me, you know, I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. These they're friends. <laughs> They're being friendly to me and shit, you know. Uh, my mom, dad, and sister didn't like me most of my life, kind of, you know. So that was kind of sad. But that meant so much to me that I realized, and this happened at the same time that Beyond the Calling came for me, that um, I'd like everybody to feel like this. Every minute of every day of their life. You know, to be full, so loved and hated at the same time, because people, when they love you, they also hate these things about you. And then they tell you and then you kind of that's true friendship, right, is love, hate and that kind of thing. You know, and they they uh, they, they always say, you're so intense, Patrick. I say, yeah, because I'm intensely making up for 42 years of not having you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving it back like totally, you know, overdosed and shit. Right. And uh, but that joy of feeling like that, to be able to build a product, a protocol that can establish that feeling almost in an instant and that it lasts for a while and then you do it again and then it kind of recreates that fire with your friends because if we're just together and saying how are you finding you and that's as far as we would go then we've lost an opportunity to be there for the other person kind of i think <laughs> but please i'm not like i don't want to dogma anybody in the world uh, and that's the nicest part about the protocol where you go and what you do is always up to you but organizations should empower their people to be there for each other and to know it yeah and um and i think about four weeks ago i was in a room in san francisco 
with our format and one of my daughters shows up right it's miley <laughs> and uh she kept saying dad i, I thought it's okay you know she's we've, she's never said anything else besides dad so she kept saying dad but then i ended up in that third question with what do we really need with her in the room and she goes um kind of lean into the eye usually when we answer that she goes you know just knowing that you guys are always there for me is enough. That's all I ever need. And I'm deeply grateful to you guys, you know, because she had just left the university all by herself to London and when she was just 17, that young kid. Yeah. And um, so these moments we can share with each other, when we look back, it's all that counts. Nothing else really matters. But we have an influence on how many of those moments can happen if we ourselves set the environment by asking the really questions and then being, being there for that other person. I really want to know how you are. How are you really? What do you need really? And for, for your best friend, those are the only two questions that matter is how are they and what do they need? Because you love them so much, you really only want to give them what they need. And what you get in return will always be 10 times more than you ever gave. And even if you never got anything in return, you did the right thing, you know? So some people are calling the format now instant karma, right? Because uh, you're putting goodness in, you're getting it back. And we have some people that go in those rooms and kind of don't do good. <laughs> you know, there's people that do that. But the cool part about it is they get it right back in the reflection group. When they come out of that group of two and they go in the reflection group and it gets reflected on what just happened, then it's out, it's out in the world now, bro. <laughs> you were not a good person just now. And now, now other people know. <laughs> so, and that's the last thing in the world you want kind of, you know, so it's, it's kind of instantly uh, balancing the universal energy uh, when people go through these rooms and spaces. By the time that person gets to the second, third or fourth room, there's a reason they haven't turned off their video. Cause you can always drop off and say the tech broke, right? There's a reason they stay in the room. And the reason is it's good for their soul. And it does something to them. It opens something up that they normally never got that feedback. Because those of us, and I was a butthole for 42 years of my life, okay, is no one ever really tells you. <laughs> you know, you think you're being normal, <laughs> but you're being an asshole, <laughs> you know. And when you get in a room where no, you were being an asshole and then someone gives you positive, appreciative, and thankful feedback, it kind of blows you off your feet. And you're like, what, what, what just happened? Because normally I... When I do this, I, I get a response that I want to have from others. And now I got this different response. And now I'm hanging out in the room because, I don't know, somehow I kind of like that. But then I realized that maybe I should also be nice back. <laughs> you know, it's really weird. It's like a self-perpetuating but self-optimizing loop by the time they get to the end of the 60 minutes if they stayed in the room. You know, if you jump out, I understand. Get out of the way because goodness is coming your way, right? You got to jump out of the room. But, um, you know, that shift changes the course of uh, people's lives. And now we have organizations that are changing the course of organizations. And if we can get this into every school, in every organization, in every government, we've got the first city, the city of Sindelfingen in Germany, where the Oberbürgermeister is going to have 600 people, employees, the firemen, the social workers, you know, you name it, anybody that works in that city, they're going to be in the format every month for eight, nine months. And they're going to design the city of the future, uh, the 600 people and not the 60 managers, you know, and, and they know that the uh, fire that they need to shift uh, is inside of them and that the format unlocks that and unleashes that in a very positive way, you know. So I think uh, bringing goodness into the world and sustaining it is what all of us at Never Done Before and, and any other facilitation in the world we really want to do. And in and, and this format, it enhances and complements everything else you do and everything else that any other facilitator does because it goes at a, that underlying layer. So complement with an I and an E. So it complements, it adds, but it also honors uh, what happens. And those, you know, five steps of kindness that are embedded in the protocol, in German, there's a word for that, what happens. You, you are würdigen the other person, okay? And in English, it's hard. It's like you honor and you acknowledge and you appreciate the other human being in the room, which we normally do after people die. We stand up in front of others and we würdige sie, ihr Leben, 
we honor them mm -hmm. and acknowledge them and appreciate them as human beings when they're gone. So if we can embed an vertigo in a regular routine that happens every day in every organization, then we're going to touch the spirit of, of the world, you see. And it's needed more now than ever before. We really, truly need to be with each other in this good, positive way with that little protocol, you know, and, uh, and that's it. That's kind of, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a long distance we have traveled, but not far we have come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for sharing hope and kindness. A final question. I can imagine that um, there are many listeners who feel touched and think, oh, I want that too. I want that too. And they might not dare. And they might sit in these meetings you described where two people speak and they might be amongst those who just listen. What would be your encouragement or advice how to kick it off, how to make the first little step that is so tiny that you cannot not do it. Yeah, to I mean, you know, just uh, really, add the really, you know. Ask your friend, how are they, really? And listen only to appreciate. Regardless of what they say, just be there and that protocol, listen, appreciate, and acknowledge after asking the question. So it's smile, hello. Ask, listen, appreciate, acknowledge. Shalah. <laughs> you know, inshallah, if you put an I in front of it, it's God's will, right? Um, mm -hmm. And just the shalah, um, as, as adding that protocol to the question with a friend and then reflect afterwards with each other, that's enough because you learn so much the first couple times you do it that the progression after that is very, very simple and very, very easy. And then for any facilitator, it's just a beautiful, easy, simple way to enhance all the other things you're doing. It could be agile. It could be um, theory you. <laughs> it could be uh, design thinking. You know, there's so many processes that are great uh, that with a little bit of this up front, how are you really at the front? And how are you now really at the back uh, is enough. It's enough, you know, because nothing more important than how were you at the front and how were you at the back of all the other great processes that, that people do, especially at and never done before. So I think, um, you know, to start with that first step with the really and listen to uh, appreciate some inshallah, inshallah, <laughs> it will be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And I will put all the information, how to reach you and learn more with and from you in the show notes. Thank you. Really. Awesome. Really. <laughs> well, And, and, you know, you can always cut this at the back, but so how are you really now? What's your, yeah, tell me, how are you? I'm present, really. present, and I'm confident, and I'm hopeful, and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. And how are you now, really? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, our state changed. We had a conversation. But as you just said, and you said it kind of like deep breathing, <laughs> it's really hot and warm. It's really warm in here now, you know, so I can feel the, the warmth of all that and all the crazy stuff we talked about also. But I kind of like the state, you know, it's a good state and comfortable and uh, enriched. And uh, the gratitude leads to, I feel blessed, but it leads to what's called bliss. So bliss is my word. This is... Uh, This is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.